who shares a commitment to getting those things done. Listen, we're humbled uh, by having again been entrusted by the American people with the responsibility of leading the people's house. We'll never take it for granted, and we will never let you down. The presidential race is as yet undecided. The Senate races have generally been going the Democrats' direction tonight. But you just saw there John Boehner, who's the current Republican Speaker of the House, who NBC projects will be the next Speaker of the House, too, as the Republicans are able to hold on to their majority uh, in the House. Again, this is not a projection for any individual seat. This is just a projection for the overall numerical majority in the House, which will leave John Boehner. Um, as speaker. Right now, in the presidential race, um, we are obviously waiting on the states that are still too close to call. Ohio at the top of that list, but also uh, Florida there, Colorado, and several others. Uh, North Carolina, Virginia. Um, we are expecting to hear momentarily from Elizabeth Warren, who has ousted Scott Brown as a senator from Massachusetts. Chris, you were reflecting before the break that you're annoyed that people are people are not giving concessions. Yeah, there's a tradition that uh, you really can't give a victory speech to your opponent accepts defeat. That's the, that's the protocol, and it's pretty powerful. And uh, the I'm waiting to hear television from. coverage has ended that Elizabeth Warren wants to give her speech before the 11 o'clock news <sighs> in Massachusetts. And if she waits for Brown, it, she might not do it. Till Maybe midnight. she's waiting so, for Scott Brown. Though. So yeah. far, Scott she Brown has be. not spoken. Neither be. has Elizabeth Warren. We are anticipating speeches from both of them. We are anticipating Elizabeth Warren's first, given the look at this, sh of this yeah. shot right now. Uh, but we'll have to see how that unfolds. Yeah, I think it's powerful because I think people watch television. You watch in any era, they watch television and they watch elections where they, they need to have some credibility. At some point, for someone to say it's over, and they the best to person to do that is the, the person who loses. They used to get out there fast with the yeah. concession, and now but, they drag their feet. But I think in Connecticut, he did say he talked to Lyndon McMahon, so maybe they're doing it by and phone Linda calls. Linda McMahon, <laughs> Linda McMahon, yeah. Linda McMahon yeah. did, give, did give a concession speech. Okay, okay. Tonight, so we should not damn her for but not Chris, having done that. But Steve. Chris is exactly right on this. I think it's very bad form to go out and give a victory speech before your opponent concedes. And there's a protocol for the campaigns talking to each other about this. The phone call is made. Uh, you have some simple human communication. When is your guy going out to give the concession speech? And then we go on after. And I think that's a tradition you don't yeah. want to see lost in America. You don't need to be on before 11 once you win the election, by the way. These aren't requirements. <laughs> well, we'll, have, I mean, we'll have to see how this works in Massachusetts. I will say, having followed the Massachusetts Senate race incredibly closely. You vote up there. I do vote right. up there. Boy, did voting in that race make me happy. It was one of those things, you know how Bob Schieffer said at the end of that debate, go out and, go out and vote. It makes you feel big and strong. I felt like I was about <laughs> 17 feet tall after I voted. How did you race. feel about his truck compared to your truck? <laughs> My truck is bigger. I thought. Thank you for mentioning it. I actually have to go to a call right now on a race that we were not previously able to characterize. In the presidential race in Arizona, we had previously described this as too early to call, but with Mitt Romney in the lead, we can now say that Mitt Romney is the projected winner in the state of Arizona. Um, on that Senate race, though, in Massachusetts, I will say that if the campaigns are counting on basic, decent human communication between them in terms of coordinating who goes first and which speech happens, they had the worst communication between them and also from each of those campaigns to the media, trying to cover it from a national perspective. It was like playing telephone through a nursery school to try to get somebody on the phone to tell you anything that was going on. Well, it was a really strange race. The animosity started with uh, the heritage uh, comment in that first debate when he went after her. But I, I have to uh, say, I'm going to speak for the liberals in this country tonight, if I may take the liberty to do that. This is exciting to see Elizabeth Warren go to the United States Senate because she is the one who has been out in front getting after Wall Street. And there's a lot of people around around the country that think that she is it's, it's, it's not possible for her to get spoiled by Washington. That she is the pure liberal, she is the pure progressive that is going to go out there and street, speak truth to power. She's the Democrat that a lot of liberals have been looking for. She's it's going to be interesting. She's a technocrat on the issue of consumer debt and family economics. Yep. And that, I mean, so we'll, we'll wait to see how her ideology plays out in Washington. But in terms of her skill set, I mean, talking about American families and the way that we have all coped with debt and things like student loan debt and the decisions that we make about where to work and how to work and when to work based on what our economic reality is as middle class families that's she's she is the pioneer in that field of scholarship What's unique so. about her as a senate freshman is that she will go into the body 
knowing more about some very important subjects than any other senator. And we haven't seen that since the last Harvard professor went into the, the Senate, that? Senator Moynihan, who knew uh, more about many subjects than any other senators. It, it, she will be uh, it respected instantly. I think she has a chance of being one of the real stars of the body uh, very, very quickly. And obviously, one of the really big stars of the Democratic Party. If she is a good senator, she can probably hold on to the seat for life, which is something that was never going to be true about Scott Brown. And so I think she will plan a different governing path than Scott Brown ever could, whatever you thought about them as individual uh, politicians. I want to go now, though, to Howard Feynman, who joins us now with some new information from the Romney campaign in terms of how they're uh, looking at their prospects and reacting to what's happened thus far tonight. Howard? Well, uh, Rachel, the new information is a uh, lack of information. Uh, they're, they're, uh, as I understand it, uh, the entire high command of the Romney campaign is, is sequestered in a spot far away from uh, where the uh, the our camera setup is, they're not responding to calls. Uh, they're in some kind of big council at this at this very moment. Uh, my my best person in the campaign, the one I've talked to for two years and who always returns my calls or my emails, uh, has gone radio silent. And what that means to me is that the Romney campaign is looking at the map. They're looking at all the numbers. They're looking at the uh, reports from on the ground, and they're. And they're probably having a very interesting and very tough conversation right now. Um, so that, that's, that's why there's been pretty much radio silence from them for at least the last 45 minutes to an hour. Well, Howard Feynman, thank you for that. Let's go actually go as close as we physically can to the Romney campaign uh, from here, which is to our friend Chris Jansen, who is on site at Romney headquarters in Boston. Uh, Chris, what Howard Feynman was describing there was essentially um, a, a, a lockout of communication from Romney campaign staffers in terms of their reaction to what's going on tonight, how they see their prospects ahead. Is that how it seems to you in Boston? Austin. Well, it certainly does, as we spoke just a few minutes ago. Uh, the people who are in that room are not answering calls, and there are several of them that we have called repeatedly. I can tell you, however, that I went out into a crowd and I found Gail Gitcho, who is the communications director for the campaign. She said that she had been talking to the folks back up in the room and claims that Governor Romney remains optimistic. And I said, based on what? And weren't they disappointed in places like Wisconsin, to which she acknowledged Yes, uh, we had hoped for something different in Wisconsin, but she says they are watching and hanging their hat on these long lines in Virginia, in places like Virginia Beach and Richmond, in the panhandle of Florida. And she said, we believe that these lines are going to go on for hours and those states may not be called for hours. And when I asked her about Ohio, she claims that their poll watchers there in Cuyahoga County, which went 69 percent for Barack Obama. Obama in 2008 are telling her that they are outperforming and Barack Obama is underperforming. And I also asked her the question that you asked me, which is, what about some of these Senate races where the Democrats are winning? And she said, we never expected those down ticket races to give us an indication of where our campaign was. We are personally unhappy for people like Scott Brown, who is a friend of the governor's, but in terms of it being predictive of the president race, we don't believe that. So that's what we're hearing from Gail, but it's completely, as Howard said, radio silence from inside that room. Chris Jansen, thank you very much. That's the most information that we've had out of the Romney side uh, from all of the people that we've got trying to reach them uh, and report on that. That was fascinating stuff. As you saw, uh, and Chris, we should mention this, Scott Brown giving his concession speech there uh, in Massachusetts as we are getting that report from Chris Jansen. That means that we are still expecting to hear from right. Elizabeth Warren, who upset him, uh, or at least unsettled seated him tonight in Massachusetts. I want to go to Chuck Todd briefly uh, for an update on what we are looking at in these three crucial too close to call races, Florida, Virginia, and Ohio. Chuck? You know, as I, as I uh, tried to nickname him, and, and I, so many of you met, mocked me for it, Flova, if you will, <laughs> uh, the big three in the battleground. But uh, Florida and Virginia, I can tell you, are models uh, tell us that point one half of one percent separate the two, both in Virginia and in Florida. Maybe one of those cases where we've got to wait uh, until everything comes in. As far as Ohio is concerned, uh, there are some concerns about how the absentee 
uh, vote has been counted, has been calculated in our model. So we still have some hesitance there. And if you've noticed, things have narrowed. But I want to just tell you where vote is missing in Ohio, because uh, I know folks are curious about that. There is a ton of vote. There is a, a couple hundred thousand votes that are missing in Cuyahoga, Lucas County, which is Toledo, the Auto Belt, barely much in there. There's still a couple hundred thousand votes we're waiting on in Cincinnati. The point is, there's a lot of blue areas that haven't come in in Ohio uh, for what it's worth. Let me go to Virginia and tell you what's remaining uh, and what could uh, what could tip the balance. We know a lot of Fairfax is finally coming in, but that's taken a while. But there is still a lot of Virginia Beach that hasn't come in. Virginia Beach is a swing area, could end up being uh, could end up being something that could help Romney. Uh, that's the stuff we're waiting on. But I tell you, Northern Virginia, there's still still could be a couple hundred thousand votes that we haven't counted there. Uh, again, the one half of one percent, and it shouldn't be surprising. We know uh, we know going back four years ago that Virginia and uh, the national vote matched almost identical in our last poll, both nationally and that. And then, of course, in Florida, what remains is. Two chunks of vote here that I want to mention, actually, two counties. Well, we're, oh, the, about, we hadn't gotten anything out of Santa Rosa, which is in Joe Scarborough's old congressional district, and I wanted to point that out. It was like <laughs> one of the last counties uh, that hadn't given us any data. But we're still waiting for quite a bit of vote in Miami-Dade and Broward. So, again, this may be one where we want to wait till all the vote is counted because it is that razor-thin close. Chuck, let me just ask you, we just have reports in terms of Florida, poll workers at the Miami-Dade County suburb of West Kendall, which is known as the Hammocks, say it could be another hour before all the voters in line cast their vote. Dozens of people there still waiting in line to go inside. They haven't even made it inside the polling place yet. Mm -hmm. Similar reports coming in from other precincts in the neighborhood of Country Walk. Uh, but voting in downtown Miami uh, has apparently ended according to local Miami media. Does any of that tell you anything specific about what to expect well, down there? Other than you were talking about all my old haunts where I grew up. I actually grew <laughs> up in East Kendall for what it's worth. The turnpike separates East Kendall and West Kendall. West Kendall uh, a growing and thriving, uh, becoming a little more Hispanic now uh, over the years, which is the story. Again, it goes back to the whole uh, the story of this election, which could be demographics. But when you look at here, what I see in Miami-Dade County is sort of, it's all about margins, right? We're not quite at 200,000 for the president here. here Here's where he was in 2008. Miami Dade, of course, you know, there's still a, a large Cuban vote, um, but it was 100 and it looks like, let me do my math, 140,000. So if you look, the president's margins are bigger this time than they were four years ago in Miami Dade County. And that would be something that could be alarming if you're a Republican. If, if the president's margin, I already told you the Orange County story up in Orlando. Yeah. Again, that's a, a demographic story. And by the way, let me show you Hillsborough. Hillsborough was supposed to be the quintessential swing uh, county going. Chuck, I have and look to at what the president's doing here. I'm sorry, just this the only time I'd interrupt you, but I we know. have a call in a, a call. state that we have not previously been able to characterize. In Minnesota, NBC News projects that the winner in Minnesota is President Obama. Uh, this is uh, this is a trend. Uh, this had previously been described as too early, but with Obama leading, it has now been called for President Obama. You are on Hillsborough County, Florida there before I ripped you away from that that's, discussion. That's fine. Jack, go ahead. Well, I just want to show you something. I just want to show you about sort of raw votes and it gives you a taste of like how does the Obama campaign do this and they really do when they think about these things they think about raw votes. Here's the the uh, president's raw vote right now in Hillsborough 276,000. He's already got more vote this time in Hillsborough than he did in 2008 in 2008. The raw number he got was 272. Now granted a lot some of this is population growth, but the point has always been and remember there's been a lot of people that have been questioning the party idea of polls and been trying to say, "Oh, this isn't going to look like 2008." All of the new voters, the new voters all over the country, uh, were less white than the national uh, than than the na than what the what the national uh, sample was in 2008. All of these new voters were going to be uh, voters that were probably going to be more likely to be Democratic voters than Republican voters. And Hillsborough is just a good way of showing that. Here it was. They've increased the number of votes. The margin's the same, but you see that these new voters seem to be uh, leaning toward the president. Chuck Todd, thank you very much. We are obviously still, we're, we're, we're looking to the details of what we have on Florida, but Florida, the, bo the bottom line here is that it is too close to call along with Ohio, North Carolina, Virginia, and Colorado. Todd Aiken was the Missouri Republican Senate candidate who lost to Claire McCaskill These in Missouri tonight. Let's go to his concession speech. Yes. They struggle with cancer, 
loss of a job, loss of a house, loss of loved ones, and um, they press on. They're the backbone of America. When called, they'll risk their lives for their country or their community, but they don't think of themselves as particularly special. They don't look to government for special deals, but they do think that the government should respect our hard-earned tax dollars that it collects. In short, they love God, they love their families, and they love our country. Now, I, I also want to tell you not only who they are, but I want to tell you what they believe. You know, we believe that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness come from Almighty God, not an almighty government. <laughs> we also believe that our Creator made us one people. There is one class in this country, Americans. <laughs> We also believe that the source of America's great strength is our faith in a loving God who allows courageous people the freedom to pursue the unique dreams that each of them have. And we believe that the Constitution is not a list of suggestions. <laughs> we believe that ordinary people built America. We believe you built that. <laughs> And if you tell Americans it won't work, or it can't be done, then you better get out of the way because we specialize in those kinds of things in America. Absolutely. We believe that the, the world is safer when America is strong, and a strong America sends hope to people around the world and fear to tyrants. In the face of tsunamis or earthquakes, we send a gray hull full of medicine and food flying the stars and stripes. You know, failed governments resort to lies. We believe that our government owes us the truth. We also believe that it's inexcusable to betray fellow Americans to terrorists when they could have been rescued. Lost to Democratic incumbent Claire McCaskill uh, tonight. That was the. Senate opponent that Claire McCaskill wanted most of all the Republicans who are running for that seat. That was even before Todd Akin made his comments about legitimate rape. We have a call in the Missouri presidential race. We have not previously been able to characterize this race, but in Missouri, NBC News projects that the winner will be Mitt Romney. Looking at that um, Todd Akin concession speech, um, Chuck, uh, uh, Chris, you were talking about how he has to give up his House seat in order to run for that right. Senate seat. You can hold on to your House seat or your Senate seat and run for Vice yeah. President or President, but he's now not only not going to be in the Senate, he's not going to be in the House. You know, the great concession speeches are personal. They're about the people who have worked their butts off for you. Uh, the best ever was Adlai Stevenson. He said, I'm too old to cry, but it hurts too much to laugh. Yeah. These wonderful lines are Ed Brook, the African American guy from Massachusetts. I love that guy. He's a good guy. He got involved yeah. with some marital problems. Yeah. When he lost, he said, I did not cry on the mountain. I will not cry in the yeah. valley. Yeah. There he, will was, be, he was a Republican. He was yeah. great. There he, will be a great one tonight in Nebraska. Bob Kerry losing this race. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He will show you what a noble and eloquent concession speech yeah. sounds Good like. Good guy. But you usually in a concession speech uh, uh, mention at least your victor and, and uh, <laughs> yes, the person that beat you. I mean, you don't start giving policy statements uh, like you're still running. We have had one. Maybe he didn't get the memo. <laughs> he, he was defeated, you know. And by the way, that, that is one reason what? not to wait for a concession speech. With Why bother waiting around for that? For that, of course, because he's breaking the... You're supposed to be poignant, wonderful, thank everybody, good night. I yeah. have something important to say, <laughs> which is that with the call in Minnesota, we learned one very important thing tonight. When Minnesota went to Barack Obama this past hour, if you add that to Michigan and you add that to Pennsylvania, what that means is that David Axelrod does not have to shave off his mustache oh, of 40 point. years. That was the bet. Minnesota, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, or his big cop mustache was going to happen.
have to go, you should ask him about it, Chris. Do you have one of those things in your brain that sort of tickles you to remind you of these things? Did, did how do you notes, remember that? Post-it notes all over my body, <laughs> <laughs> secretly. <laughs> ask him David Axelrod is with us now, and you should oh, ask great. him about but it. But does Dave. Joe Scarborough not have to grow a muscle? No, okay. he lost, I think right he lost now, five grand Axelrod on the deal. Strategies for the Obama <laughs> campaign. David, why don't you give us a, at least a, a, a couple optional tours to the rest of the night in terms of states you expect to report fairly soon and throughout the night and where your candidate might go from here to victory. Well, in terms of the states, Chris, uh, you know, obviously we're looking at the same things you're looking at when you have very close races. You look at where the uh, remaining vote is, the uncounted vote is. Uh, as you've pointed out, uh, a much of that vote in Florida comes from Miami-Dade. That's a strong area for us. So we're going to want to wait and see uh, what happens when all those votes uh, are counted. Uh, we, we, we feel there are pockets of strength for us in Virginia that are uh, outstanding. Uh, Ohio, we like the pattern that we see it's going to be close as we always anticipated uh, but it's been a slow count in Ohio partly because the lines have been very long that's true in Virginia as well so once people are online uh, they they get to vote as they should uh, so uh, for a variety of factors the counts have been slow and uh, we're gonna wait and see but we're very hopeful about what uh, uh, about what the outcome is gonna be yeah I just one, one thing I think is impressive so far is we've got the count if you look at the map we're looking at the blue up there at the top in the middle. President Obama's done very well, it seems to me, in what we used to call the Rust Belt, now called yes. the Tech Belt. Tell us about the policies that led to that uh, resurgence, I think you'd have to call it, in the last uh, year or so. Well, there's no doubt that the president's, first of all, that decision that he made, and I was there when he made it, uh, and it didn't look like a very good political decision at the time to intervene to save the American auto industry, was absolutely essential to that region. When you look at a state like Ohio, where one of eight jobs uh, is generated by the auto industry, the fact that the auto industry has come roaring back has been a key to the economic revival uh, of that state. And the president's <coughs> initiatives to, to uh, revive manufacturing through various tax credits and export initiatives and uh, so on is very, very important. And then on the other side, <coughs> you had Governor Romney, who, uh, you know, whose history had been one uh, uh, that gave people concern uh, on outsourcing and particularly on opposing the auto bailout that was so central uh, to that region. So uh, I, I, we always looked at the industrial Midwest as a, a great opportunity for us uh, in this election, and um, I think the results tonight are bearing that out. Ed Schultz wants to ask a question, but one month last where I grew up is Pennsylvania, and I was thinking how you decided, uh, I, I would talk to the vice president when I interviewed him the other night, and thanks for those interviews, of course, but you know what he said was something very powerful. You guys knew that the other side, Romney was gonna try to head fake or whatever going up there, but you held back and decided not to send either candidate up into Pennsylvania. What did you know at that time about the situation in Pennsylvania that gave you that confidence to leave it alone? Well, as we as we said at the time, we you know you have a 1.1 million vote Democratic registration advantage in the state. Um, some of the same issues that dogged Romney elsewhere dogged him uh, there. You you know in the western half of the state, uh, you have those issues uh, about whether he's actually going to stand up for middle class people and working people uh, in the eastern part of the state in the Philadelphia suburbs. There were real concerns about his position on on questions of women's health and choice on Planned Parenthood. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we we thought uh, we had great strength there and the ability to resist uh, what was an unbelievable torrent. I mean, they spent a ton of money uh, in that state. But I really think what happened was they looked at the whole field and said, we're not going to make it in these battleground states and we better kind of expand the field. And uh, we've got the money to do it. Let's expand the field and see if we can shake something loose. Okay. And, uh, and, they, and they just couldn't. David, great to have you on tonight. Congratulations so far. We'll be back to you later perhaps tonight. We'll be here Thank for you. a while. Thank Good you. Good to be with you. Thank well, you. And, and congratulations on keeping your mustache. I appreciate yeah. that, too. <laughs> Let's watch Scarborough grow his if we win Florida. <laughs> Excellent. We want to go now uh, to Massachusetts, where the senator-elect from the state of Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, is addressing her supporters. Thank you. Thank you. This... <laughs> no, no. This victory belongs to you.
that has been chipped at, squeezed, and hammered. We're going to fight for a level playing field, and we're going to put people back to work. owners who are tired of the system rigged against them. We're going to hold the big guys accountable. Yeah. Yeah. To all the seniors who deserve to retire with the security they earned, we're going to make sure your Medicare and Social Security benefits are protected and that millionaires and billionaires pay their fair share. I'm going to interrupt Elizabeth Warren here because we have another call in another Senate race. Virginia's Senate race had been too close to call. NBC News now projects that Tim Kaine, the Democrat, has beaten George Allen in the Senate race in Virginia. Which is, again, this was not a sure bet. Virginia at the presidential level is still too close to call. But in the Senate race, uh, Tim Kaine has defeated George Allen. We're going to take a quick break right now. Up next, polls are going to be closed in five more states, including the biggest electoral prize of the night, which is California. This is MSNBC's continuing coverage of the 2012 election. We'll be back right after this.